All right. Um, have you heard ever of uniform circular motion? There it is. You have. Um, but if you're like, wait, why are we doing notes about this again? When we did this before, we did it only in the context of motion. In other words, we didn't know anything about force yet. So um, that's what we need to update. I think that deserves a little enthusiasm, right? Um, so remember that uh, when you have uniform circular motion, I realize that's sort of awkward, uh, uncorrect grammar, um, but you know what I mean. So when you have uniform circular motion, then you have a centripetal acceleration, which means it's directed toward the center of the circle, and the magnitude of it is v squared over r, or omega squared r, where this v here is the speed. Notice there's no vector hat on it. Of course, if you're in uniform circular motion, your speed's constant, but the direction of it is constantly changing. And um, this omega is your angular velocity, measured in radians per second. OK, um, so that's a thing. And we did problems with that back then. Um, you can go back and just flip through your notes about that and kind of glance at the problems you did back then about that, if you feel like that's something you want to do. Um, so, um, so now, since we know that the sum of all forces is equal to mass times acceleration, if that's true, then acceleration toward the center must require unbalanced force. Ooh, I almost put a vector hat over the summation sign. That would be bad. Uh, it must require that the sum of all forces is toward the center. Now, in some physics books, let's, let me see if our physics book does this. Let me just flip back in the chapter here. Um, let's see what they say. Actually, I can look at the little summary at the end. In some physics books and um, places where you can find information, yeah, they don't, they don't do it in the bad way. Some, sometimes you see this. Uh, sometimes you see um, centripetal force is equal to if, um, ma if acceleration has to be v squared over r, then when you multiply that by mass, you would get m v squared over r. I mean, that's uh, sort of true. Um, but this idea implies implies, there's an L and an I there, I know how to spell implies, um, implies, I hope that's right after I just said that, um, the, uh, that there is an actual centripetal force. And there isn't. I mean, there's no, like, if you look at a situation uh, we'll do a couple examples in just a minute. You've looked at an, an example where you have uniform circular motion. There isn't ever going to be a force that you label force centripetal in your force diagram. It's always the result of other forces that are acting on the object. So I really don't like this. Um, so uh, instead, Let's write that when you have uniform circular motion, the sum of all forces must equal 
mv squared over r. And I shouldn't have put a vector hat on that, because if this is a vector quantity on this side, then this needs to be a vector quantity, and this is not. So let's remove that hat. Take off your hat. Um, mv squared over r, and we'll say that that is toward the center in exactly the same way that we defined this. No vector hat on that. We just said, oh yeah, it's toward the center, right? All right. So um, that's what we need to do. We just need to understand when there's uniform circular motion, make your force diagram, and then the sum of all forces must be toward the center. That's got to be the winning direction, and it has to equal this. Okay, um, that's it. So basically, um, the notes, the extent of the notes, like the real short summary of this is, hey, uh, centripetal acceleration is V squared over R, and force equals mass times acceleration. Therefore, centripetal force, when you have uniform circular motion, uh, it's got to be MV squared over R, right? Mass times acceleration. That's it. Um, so uh, I'm going to give you two examples. I think these are going to be acutely helpful for doing the problems that I selected for you to do in the book. Um, this is two classic uh, examples or, or types of uniform circular motion problems. So example one, um, a car drives at, uh, you might be given, you know, miles per hour and have to do some unit conversions. I'm going to bypass that. So a car drives at, let's say, 20 meters per second around a curve. Now, curves, if you drive around anywhere, Rockbridge County or anywhere else, um, curves in the road are not perfect little pieces of circles, but they can be approximated as that. You can always say, well, that's about, you know, a little piece of a circle that has a radius of whatever. So let's say our car is driving around a curve that has a radius of, and if you think about it, if you're looking down at a map, the, these things have pretty large radii. Um, so let's say that this particular one um, has a radius of 75 meters. So that's like, you know, most of a football field. Um, and if that's the radius, 20 meters per second, that's about, I don't know, 45 miles an hour, something like that. Um, so we'll see. See how the... Um, how we do here. So what minimum coefficient of friction is required for the car not to slip. And uh, we just need to pause here for one second to make sure we understand that when you're talking about a car driving on a road where the rubber meets the road, literally, um, we are talking about static friction. Now that is counterintuitive because you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, that car is definitely moving. True, but the, um, for a car to successfully drive on a road without slipping, the contact point between the tire and the road as the tire, this is a great visual here, isn't it? Uh, as the tire rolls along that road, um, that contact point is not changing. So um, hold on, I have a better visual for you here. So as a car drives along the road, the contact point between the wheel and the road is not changing. And that, that is static friction. So uh, if the contact point is changing, like if the wheels were locked up and it's like skidding like this, you do not want to be in that car when that's happening. If you are experiencing uh, kinetic friction, between the wheels and the road in a car that you are in, that car is skidding out of control. Um, or maybe it's a controlled skid if you're uh, into the Tokyo Drift or whatever. Um, so uh, when it's driving as intended on the, uh oh, locked up, locked up, skidding. 
Um, so, uh, anyway, I think I made my point. Um, it's uh, static friction that we're talking about. Um, okay, so um, let's see. And notice I didn't give the mass of the car, so hmm, I wonder if that's going to be a problem. Well, let's set this up and see how it goes. So um, this is, let's say we're looking at a rear view, like the car is driving directly into the page away from us. And we made a force diagram, and here's the um, center. I like to sometimes in this kind of um, situation when I'm making the force diagram to just mark where the center of the circle is, even though you know I'm not going to draw the circle. I'm just drawing a little X where that center is so that I can see and be reminded that I need unbalanced force toward that center. Okay, so the car is like driving directly into the page. It's turning to the right around this way. So what forces do I have? Well, I've got the force of gravity in the car, the mg, and then I would have a normal force. And then, um, well, if it's moving in a circle, there has to be some unbalanced force toward the center. So what force is this? Well, this is the friction force. And per our discussion there, it's static friction. And that's it. Um, so, okay. Um, let's see. That means, so this right here, that is, since these are canceling each other out, that is the unbalanced force. There I go, making that vector hat on that again. Is just equal to that friction force, which is toward the center of the circle. Okay, so uh, let's see. That means that since we're talking about uniform circular motion, the sum of all forces, god dang it, is equal to mv squared over r. And uh, we're talking about the magnitude of that, right? Because this is not a vector on this side, so if we really want to be um, upright and true about things that we write, uh, I'm just going to put absolute value signs around that to indicate I'm just interested in the magnitude of it, the size of it. Okay, so, um, and here we have determined that the only thing pointing toward the center along that radial line is that static friction. So that is the unbalanced force toward the center. So this is why I don't like this thing. Like, I don't want you to think that there's going to be some force that shows up in the diagram that should be labeled, oh, that's the centripetal force. I mean, you can kind of say that here. You can kind of say, oh, this is the centripetal force. No, but it's a friction force. It's just that in this particular case, the thing that's pointing toward the center is this friction force, and nothing else is playing along that radial line. Um, all right, so uh, let's see. The, Moving over here, uh, static friction max is equal to the coefficient times the normal force. And uh, the normal force is equal to mg. So I think we're ready to rock and roll here. So uh, I have my static coefficient times mg is equal to m times v squared over r, and the mass, that cancels out, so I did not need to know the mass of the car. That doesn't matter, because um, if you're like, well, wouldn't a bigger car need more force? Yes, but a bigger car is going to, in exactly the same linear proportionality to mass, is uh, going to have more friction also. So um, let's see. That means my static coefficient, I just need to divide by g. And let's see what we get. I get uh, 20 squared divided by 75 times 9.8. And um, I tried to make up numbers that seemed pretty reasonable, and I think I have succeeded here in terms of how fast this car was going around this particular curve. So like a static friction uh, coefficient of 0.54 is um, very manageable for tires on road. 
Um, just to give you a ballpark, you can actually look this up. You can dial this up on the internet and do a quick search on this. The coefficient of friction between tires, uh, like good tires, not really old, bald tires. Good tires in a dry road is about 0.9. Um, somewhere between 0.7 and 0.9 anyway. So, anyway, so this should be good. You should be able to take this turn at 20 meters per second, about 45 miles an hour, and be uh, perfectly safe, not feel like you're about to go flying off the road. Cool. All right, uh, one more example for you. This might have a couple parts. Um, so let's say that a car is now going to drive over a hill. Have you ever wondered why, uh, if you've ever had this experience, my sister and I, I have a sister who's uh, just a little more than a year younger than me, um, and uh, this, when we were kids, and we used to be like in a car that drove over a hill like this, um, and uh, every once in a while, like if the car is going fast enough and the conditions are just right, the hills, uh, you know, uh, certain steepness, I guess you could say, roundness, then uh, we would have this sensation where like you sort of almost feel like you're lifting up a little bit, especially like just as you come over the top and sort of crest the hill. And we, we used to call that losing your stomach. I don't know why. I mean, maybe you've had that experience and you can uh, sympathize with that description of it. But I bet you know what I'm talking about. I bet you know that feeling. And if you don't, if you've never had it in a car, certainly you've had that experience like on a roller coaster maybe or some other kind of uh, amusement park ride. So um, why does that happen? Well, I think we're going to maybe understand that now. So let's say this car, uh, let's say it's the same. I said 20 meters per second. Now think about this. This is a side view now of what's going on. Like what, kind of, what would be a reasonable radius for this hill? We can't make it have a radius of like one meter because that would be like more of a speed bump. If this car like drove into that, it would be more of a like rip the front off of your car situation. So the, a hill is probably going to have a pretty large radius. Um, let's say, let's make this one have a radius of, um, well, let's use the same number that we used in the last one. Let's say it's 75 meters. And now again, like not all hills are perfectly round, but if you're like any particular part of a hill um, is, you know, it's reasonable to approximate it as a little arc of a circle. So you can do this. It's a good approximation. I think one of the things that contributes to that feeling that you have when you drive over a hill like this is how round the hill actually is. Um, the rounder it is, the more it's successfully approximated by a circle, um, I think the more likely you are to have this feeling because you get a consistent thing that's happening there. Um, all right, so anyway, what would the force diagram look like for um, let's say for a passenger in this car, and let's say uh, the mass of this passenger is um, 65 kilograms. I'm an average-ish type person. Um, all right. So uh, I haven't asked a particular question here, so let's just kind of like do the physics and see how this plays out. Um, so let's make a free body diagram of that person. Well, you know, gravity uh, doesn't really care at all about what's happening. Gravity doesn't care that this person is in a car driving over a hill. Gravitational force on the, on the person is the same as it would be in any other situation around the surface of our planet. Um, and then there's the normal force. But um, before I draw that normal force in, of course, you're tempted to just make the normal force equal to this, right? Uh, where's the center of this circle? It's down here, and if this is where the center of the circle is, there must be unbalanced force toward the center of the circle. There has to be. If there isn't, you don't get circular motion. So, um, hmm. well, the force of gravity um, doesn't care, and it's not going to change, right? That can't, like, back off just because you're driving over a hill or become stronger or something like that. 
Um, so what must change? The normal force has to change. So this, I'm going to exaggerate this, the normal force is going to back off. And this, my friends, is the feeling that you have. When you are um, driving over that hill, now you are used to, when you're just driving along a flat road or you're sitting in your chair right now or whatever, you're very much accustomed to feeling the same amount of normal force as how much gravity there is. And when you feel your own weight, like sitting in your chair right now, if you're sitting in a chair right now, lying on your bed right now, whatever you're doing right now, you are used to feeling that upward push on you that is exactly equal to the gravitational force on you. And that's how you feel your weight. The gravitational force is not actually what you're feeling. What you're feeling is the resistance to that. What you're feeling is something pushing up on you. Chair, bed, maybe you're like lying on a hardwood floor right now, face down, I'm not sure, whatever you're doing. So it's that push up on you that that's what you feel. So if that backs off, the upward push on you, you don't feel all of this anymore. You only feel this much. So you feel lighter than you usually do. Um, and that's why, like, if you've ever gone to uh, some amusement park where they have one of those rides where there's a tower and you're sitting in, like, a little thing here with a whole bunch of chairs in it, and uh, I think the drop zone is one of the names for these things, and there's you, like, sitting there and it raises this thing up to here, and then it basically drops it, and you feel like weightless or, or some like much lighter version of yourself. Um, and uh, that's because as it's falling, with that acceleration downward, you're feeling less, less normal force is required of you. So if you are accelerating downward, then the normal force backs off to make sure that there's enough unbalanced force in the direction of the acceleration. Okay, so here, the direction of the acceleration must be toward the center of the circle. So, the unbalanced force here is equal to gravity's winning minus the normal force on the person is losing. Now, if, this is, if these are the particular details of this problem, then uh, we have m v squared over r equal to mass of the person with g minus the normal force on them. And uh, the mass of the person, 65 kilograms, going 20 meters per second over the 75 meter radius hill is equal to 65 times 9.8. So if I want to see how much normal force there is on them, uh, just do a little math here. So let's do that. I've got 65 times 9.8 minus 65 times 20 squared over 75. And that's about 290 newtons. OK, so what does that mean? Well, it would be much more meaningful to compare this to how much normal force they normally feel, or they usually feel. Um, and when this person is at rest, uh, or moving at a constant velocity, of course, um, then their normal force would be equal to the gravitational force. So um, the normal force on them when they're at rest is, uh, what is their mass? 65 times 9.8 is 637. Newtons. So this is actually you don't you don't want to drive over this hill. This would be uh, pretty treacherous, I think. This person feels less than half of her weight driving over this hill. 
Usually, normal force is 637 newtons. Here, driving over this hill, it drops to less than half. So that is crazy. You have never driven over a hill like that in your life. Probably you've been on a roller coaster or something that had this much of a, a difference. Um, all right. So um, real quick, what do you think would happen if this person instead drove through a dip in the road with exactly the same characteristics here? Um, first of all, how are they going to feel? And... There's the center of the circle now. What's the force diagram going to look like? Well, now instead of um, unbalanced force toward the center down here, now the center is up here. Sorry, this, is, this little x goes with my diagram. That's not meaningful to this road. There's the center. So the normal force is going to have to increase. And you know that this is true because you've been on roller coasters and things, and you know that as you drive through that dip down here, you're going to feel heavier down there, right? Isn't there some, like, roller coaster that's called the Intimidator or something? And, like, at the very beginning, there's like, some crazy turn, and you feel, like, super heavy. I've talked to a lot of students who have been on this ride, and their experience is, like, sometimes they, um, like black out or the start to experience like tunnel vision or their vision goes black and white. There's all sorts of sorts of physiological things that happen when all of a sudden there's a lot more normal force on you because it, it uh, drains, it tends to, um, there isn't enough internal force on you to keep all of the blood um, where it usually is in your body, like under normal gravitational circumstances. Um, so uh, weird stuff happens. Um, some people, even on this Intimidator ride, which they had to modify, by the way. When they built this thing, um, they had people go on it, and like too many people were experiencing like bad effects. So they, uh, they softened up that curve a little bit, but it's still pretty intense. I have not been on it. I'm not a huge fan of roller coasters. Thank you very much. Or jumping out of airplanes, or this thing. Uh, just not really, really my scene. Um, I like sitting in chairs. They're not moving. We're moving at a constant velocity. That's okay. Um, so anyway, um, this now, sum of all forces, is now equal to the normal force minus the gravitational force. And how's that all going to play out? It's the mv squared over r plus the mass of the person times 9.8 is equal to the normal force. So instead of being uh, 347 newtons lighter here, she's going to be 347 newtons heavier. 347. Oh, boy. Math in my head. I think that that's right. Um, 347. Just going to check to make sure. Uh, I'm just doing the whole mv squared over r again to double check everything. Uh, bingo. That's it. So um, now she feels like more than 50% heavier. And then it makes sense that it would be the same difference um, if it's the same radius and the same speed. All right. Those should help a lot, those examples with the problems that you need to do in the book. Cheerio.